The definition of a sun-synchronous orbit is a near-polar orbit whose nodal precession rate is equal to Earth's mean orbital rate around the sun. So in geometric terms, this means that the orientation of the orbital plane of a sun-synchronous orbit remains constant with respect to the sun vector, as is shown in the animation here. So what we have here is a 1260 roughly kilometer altitude 100.7 degree inclination sun synchronous orbit and the yellow vector here is pointing to the sun and the blue vector here is a velocity vector of the earth with respect to the sun. Now watch what happens when we speed up the time here in the simulation. The orbital plane here is processing due to the J2 perturbation, and the sun vector is rotating at the same rate with respect to the Earth, so relative to each other, the orbital plane and the sun vector are approximately fixed. So we can see this as we speed the time up, these two are staying relatively fixed to each other. We can speed it up even more to see that. And then if we rewind, and then we're going to watch this also from the North Pole, so just to get another perspective of what this looks like. So if we rotate, zoom out a bit, we see that the velocity vector, so since Earth is in a near circular orbit, the eccentricity is around 0 0.016, the velocity vector and the sun vector are close to perpendicular to each other. And we can see this in animation here. As Earth is going around the sun, the velocity vector is rotating, the orbital plane is rotating, and then the sun vector with respect to the Earth is all rotating. And they're all rotating at the same rate because we are in a sun-synchronous orbit and we chose the orbital parameters to be in this orientation. So hopefully this animation gives you a better intuitive understanding of how these sun-synchronous orbits are defined. Here's an example of the ground tracks that sun-synchronous orbits make. Since they are near polar orbits, they get complete coverage of the Earth's surface, which also makes them a very useful orbit for Earth observation and science. So Europe's getting a bit crowded here, and if you'd like me to add your city to the plots in the future videos, let me know in the comments when you're watching from. And also, let me know if you know the significance of Broom Bridge here in Dublin, Ireland. Big hint, it has to do with quaternions, which apply to spacecraft attitude control. And here's an example of the orbital elements of a sun-synchronous orbit over one year of time, where note that the right ascension increases by 360 degrees in one year, which is exactly how the sun-synchronous orbit is defined. And I'll be getting more into the details about the numerical error here in the semi-major axis later in this video. So this is the 34th video in the series, and this is the second time I'm making this sun-synchronous orbits video. And this one will be going over the definition of a sun-synchronous orbit, the J2 perturbation, and how you can model the drift in the right ascension, how to select altitude and orbital inclination for sun-synchronous orbits, repeating ground tracks, as is shown here on the bottom, orbital trajectory simulation, so how to actually plug this into software, and then going into the sp Python, how to write the spice kernel that I use for the Cosmographia simulation that I have here, and then going a bit over the numerical solver error that goes into solving these equations of motion and if you haven't seen it already in this channel i have the space engineering podcast which is also available on spotify google Podcasts, and simplecast and i'm also making videos in spanish all of which i'll have links in the description too so this video is heavily based on this paper called the ABCs of Sun Synchronous Orbit Mission Design by this guy, Ronald J. Bowen. He is from JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So whenever I talk about anything they're going to talk about in this video, I'm going to be referencing this paper because this is a great paper and goes into much more detail than I will in this video. So if you want to read more details, more derivations on the equations that I'll be showing, be sure to check this out and I'll leave a link in the description to this paper. So let's start with the definition of a sun-synchronous orbit. So from that paper, we get that the general definition of a sun-synchronous orbit is a near-polar orbit with a nodal or right ascension precession rate equal to Earth's mean orbital rate around the sun. So in equation form, this means that the derivative of the right ascension of the spacecraft orbit with respect to time is equal to the derivative of Earth's mean anomaly around the sun with respect to time. And notice that this isn't true anomaly, it's mean anomaly, since the Earth is not in a circular orbit. Now this causes the orbital plane and the sun vector to remain approximately fixed with respect to each other. And note that this does not guarantee by itself a daily or even bi-daily repeating ground track. More analysis needs to go into determining the amount of time between repeat passes over the same latitude and longitude coordinates, which we'll be getting to later in this video. And in practice, sun-synchronous orbits tend to be nearly circular, which we will be assuming in this analysis. And again, note that the sun-synchronous orbits are near polar, so they cover nearly all latitudes and all longitudes, thus providing global coverage as is seen in the ground track plot here. 
Here's a quick review of the J2 perturbation, which is the main driving force of the precession of the orbit. And if you want more details on this, I have a longer video focusing on the J2 perturbation and how to apply it into Python, which I'll have a link in the description to. So the J2 perturbation comes from the fact that because Earth is spinning, its equatorial radius is larger than its polar radius, which can be seen on the diagram on the right here. And this causes a force due to gravity on a spacecraft to no longer be modeled at the geometric center of the Earth, but a little bit off it. So if we imagine a spacecraft on the top right here, instead of modeling the gravity as coming from the geometric center right here, it would come from a little bit in this direction here. And same if the spacecraft were down here, the center of gravity would come from somewhere around here. And this causes a torque on the angular momentum vector of the spacecraft's orbit, thus rotating the orbital plane. And just as a reference, this is how the J2 perturbation is plugged into differential equation in Python when modeled in Cartesian coordinates. The JPL paper that I mentioned before gives us the equation for the time derivative of the right ascension of an orbit when modeling the J2 perturbation, which is a function of semi-major axis eccentricity and inclination. So we have this equation where omega dot which is the right ascension, the time derivative of right ascension is equal to negative three halves J2 AE, in this case is the radius of the Earth, P squared N times the cosine of I, where this P variable is equal to the semi major axis times one minus E squared, and N is a mean motion, which is equal to the square root of mu over semi major axis cubed. So since we are assuming circular orbits for this analysis, we set eccentricity over here to zero, which makes P equal to A, which is a semi-major axis. And then the semi-major axis, since the eccentricity is zero, is equal to the Earth radius plus whatever altitude we pick for the orbit. And this gives us this equation right here for the derivative of the right ascension. But we are looking to solve for inclination as a function of altitude. So we'll rearrange this following equation to get this inclination as a function of altitude is equal to the arc cosine or inverse cosine of negative two times the time rate of change of the right ascension of the spacecraft, three times J2 radius of earth over semi major axis squared, square root of mu over A cubed, where mu is a gravitational parameter of the earth. Plugging in a range of values for altitudes gives us this plot here, which is the same as the one as is shown in the JPL paper for inclination as a function of altitude. And this little table on the right here shows a few values where I'll be plugging in the 890 and the 1260 kilometer orbits to the ground tracks since they are repeated on a daily basis on their ground tracks. So here are the ground tracks for those 890 and 1260 kilometer altitude sun synchronous orbits plotted for 48 hours. And notice that these ground tracks do in fact repeat, but not exactly over each other. The repeating ground tracks have some space in between them, which the paper covers in much more detail if you're interested. So again, going into this paper, it goes a lot deeper into all the equations that go behind how many orbits are in between a repeating ground track for a sun synchronous orbit based on the altitude of that sun synchronous orbit. But what we get is this plot right here, which I'll zoom in a little bit, which shows us the repeat cycle on the y axis. So how many days it takes to repeat a ground track versus the approximate altitude here on the x axis. And the 890 kilometer orbit is this one right here that I picked. And the 1260 is this one here that I picked. And I picked them because they have a repeat cycle every single day, which is the one on the y axis here. And if you want to know more, it's basically that the change in longitude between consecutive nodal crossings for an orbit, which is he calls a fundamental interval is calculated as delta L equals omega E, where omega is the earth rotation rate, which is once every 24 hours minus the time derivative of the right ascension of the orbit times the orbital period. And again, if you want more details, I highly, highly recommend this paper because he does a really good job of explaining all the math that goes behind this. So now let's take a look at the orbital element plots over time. And here we have the six orbital elements plotted over 365 days, one year. So the first one we'll take a look at is the right ascension versus time, which in this case increases by 360 degrees over the year, which makes sense and is what we're expecting because we said that the sun synchronous orbit is defined as the right ascension rate of change is equal to the Earth mean anomaly rate over time, which is 360 degrees in one year. So that all makes sense. 
And then let's take a look at true anomaly and argument of perigee. And these are both kind of loosely defined because we said for this case that we're going to use circular orbits. And for circular orbits, the periapse point isn't strictly defined because a periapse point by definition is the closest point in an orbit. But in a circular orbit, they're all the same distance away. So it's a bit arbitrarily defined, which is why they look so strange. The eccentricity and the inclination are just oscillating over time, which is something that expected. It's not really too much here. And it's a very small amount. You can see the max that the eccentricity deviates is 0 0.001, so not that much. But then the semi-major axis over time oscillates, which makes sense. But there's also, as you can see here, a secular decrease over time. And that's actually numerical error because we know that gravity is a conservative force. So energy is conserved when there are only conservative forces at play. But the reason that this decreases over time is due to numerical error, and we can see that. And continuing on numerical error, here we can compare two ordinary differential equation solvers or ODE solvers that we have in Python and compare and see how they differ from each other. So the bottom one here is DOPRI5, which is a runge cut of 4-5 method, which is the same thing that I showed in the last slide. And it aligns pretty well with what we would, we would expect. So we would expect that the right ascension would change by 360 degrees over this year, which it did. And we expect the semi-major axis to stay constant, which it wasn't. It oscillates, but also secular decreases but this is better than compared to El Soda where El Soda decreases in semi-major axis by over 500 kilometers and that's almost half of the altitude of this orbit so it's obviously extremely relevant but the difference between the two is that El Soda runs anywhere between five to ten times faster than Dopri 5 so there's a bit of a trade-off there and another interesting thing about having this numerical error in the semi-major axis is that we saw from the differential equation that said the rate of change of the right ascension over time is a function of the semi-major axis inclination eccentricity. But as the solver is solving this problem and it's gaining numerical error and decreasing the semi-major axis, that rate of change of the right ascension is also changing over time, which is why we also see that this RAN has a lot more error. We don't expect the RAN to change by more than 360 degrees over time. But in this case, it, it rotates more than 50 degrees above that. So it rotates about 410 degrees, which we know for a fact is not what we would expect from these differential equations. So we we can see and we have we can have a high degree of confidence that the in this case the runge cut of four or five solved this problem with more accuracy than el soda but again el soda took roughly is roughly five to ten x faster so it really depends on the type of problem that you're solving and when you want to trade off that okay we can take a little bit of error on energy here because semi-major axis is proportional to the amount of energy in an orbit versus the time of computation. So we have to take that into account and it's comparing two different solvers that we have at our disposal using the SciPy package in Python. So be sure to hit like and subscribe to stay up to date with all the new videos coming out on this channel. And if you haven't seen already, I have roughly over 50 videos on this channel on orbital mechanics with Python. And I'm also working through a series on spacecraft attitude control with Python. So a simulation like you see here of detumbling. And in the next videos in the orbital mechanics series, I'm going to be going over interplanetary trajectories with gravity assist, which is going to be a whole sub series in itself. But it's pretty complex and it's super interesting, all the math that goes into it. So something like the Voyager trajectories that you see here that use a bunch of flybys to get to where they need to go which in this case is out of our solar system which is pretty crazy and again i have the space engineering podcast on this channel which is also available on spotify google Podcasts, and simplecast and about this video please let me know if there's anything confusing that i mentioned about this video i covered i feel like a bit of information in a short amount of time and i may have gone too quickly through stuff so again let me know if there's anything confusing or anything you want me to elaborate on i'll have a bunch of links in the description for you so yeah, that's pretty much it. Again, let me know any questions or comments that you have on the video, and thank you for watching.